we need to rethink how we conceptualize power. We often think of power as power over others, as a zero-sum game. My gain is your loss. But if power is the ability to get the outcomes we want, sometimes you can only do it by power with others, by cooperation. This is neoliberalism. That is neoliberalism, the theory of international relations, which is distinct from economic neoliberalism. Neoliberalism in international relations is all about building international institutions which seek to foster cooperation and peace in a world of anarchy and mistrust. These institutions, Cohen argues, help define the meaning and importance of state action. So whether you're studying international relations at university or not, this video will give you the lowdown on ideas that span the likes of Joseph Nye and Robert Cohen, and perhaps we can build a better world together. Neoliberalism is a broad term we use to describe a series of ideas in the liberal tradition which have merely been formulated since the 1970s. If you would like to learn about some older liberal ideas stretching back hundreds of years, then you can watch this video on classical liberalism, which is also available on my channel. Now, what distinguishes neoliberalism from those older liberal ideas is that neoliberals consciously decided to adopt a series of assumptions which were typical of the more cynical but very influential group of scholars called neorealists, which you can also find about here. In the mid-20th century, many were keen to blame the recent devastation across Europe and elsewhere on the failure of liberal ideas and their alleged unwillingness to deal with the realities of the world. Neoliberals therefore decided to argue for the validity of their conclusions on their critics' own terms, and this was very effective. Institutions were here to stay. In this video, we'll cover how neoliberals understand states, how they view the potential for cooperation, and at the end, we'll look at some things you need to keep in mind when designing your own international institutions. So let's get started thinking like a neoliberal. Part 1. Interests. First off, let's take a look at three founding assumptions which neoliberalism borrowed from neorealism. Firstly, neoliberalism is state-centric. What this means is that despite the focus on international institutions, the primary actors in international relations around which things revolve are states. International institutions, and anything else for that matter, are only relevant insofar as they pertain to the behaviours and actions of states. Secondly, states are egoist, or in other words, self-interested. They will not sacrifice themselves for some higher ideal or for the good of others. They can be relied upon to act selfishly. Thirdly, states are utility maximizers, meaning they will seek to make the most of a given situation and the resources available to them. This third foundation isn't hugely new to the liberal tradition, as they have long understood states to be rational actors. They are capable of deciding on goals and working out the likely most effective route to achieve those goals. Classical scholars like John Locke understood this ability to reason as the source of human progress. The change here is that they have adopted neorealist and game theoretic ways of talking about this assumption. These conditions give rise to a world which is quite precarious. States are selfish and relatively good at it. Now, traditions like neorealism regard this state of affairs as inescapable. In the words of renowned neorealist John Mearsheimer, the sad fact is that international politics has always been a ruthless and dangerous business, and it is likely to remain that way. Neoliberalism, however, maintains that there is something that can be done about this. This idea that we do not have to settle for the world that we have is the defining feature of the liberal tradition. They are confident in the potential for progress and the human ability to improve their way of life. Anarchy, that is the absence of a central authority in the international system, therefore does not have the same effects at all times in history. Anarchy is a vacuum in which we can construct better ways of cooperating with each other. One reason for this distinction is that whilst neorealists believe that states seek power over others as a response to the way of the world, neoliberals have a much more diverse understanding of what states want. Rather than power maximizers or security maximizers, states pursue a wide variety of interests that shift in priority depending on the circumstances. As well as power, neoliberals will therefore much more often write in terms of interest. So let's look at one popular way which neoliberals conceptualize what states want. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Joseph Nye was working leader here at Harvard University and popularized the term soft power to refer to ways in which states could incentivize rather than coerce others into doing what they want. Soft power mainly focuses on using things like culture and reputation to get other states that want what you want. In American terms, the key is to become the shining city on the hill which others can aspire to be. This, in contrast with hard power, military power which allows you to make others do what you want in spite of what they want. For example, India's soft power has recently grown with its movie industry. China has long been harnessing soft power resources by establishing Confucius Institutes around the world, and Japan actively hires young English speakers to work in its government and schools, the last of which I have some personal experience with. All of these things incrementally make a country more attractive, make others want to emulate a way of life. 
And if others are trying to emulate your way of life, then they're going to want the same thing as the new one. Nye argues that the prime example of this is the end of the Cold War between the US and the USSR. In his words, when the Berlin Wall went down, it did not go down under an artillery barrage of hard power. It went down under hammers and bulldozers. In other words, their minds had been changed. Now, whilst the idea of soft power does, to some extent, allow us to comprehend the opportunities and abilities of actors that do not have a military, it is still very clear that Nye at least sees soft power as something that states are mainly in control of. Now, Nye and other neoliberals don't think that there is no place for hard power or that it's ineffective. The problem with hard power on its own is that it's risky and it's costly. It is therefore better to utilise what Nye called smart power which is the ability to combine hard power and soft power to get what you want. To use a simple example, you're going to have a much easier time going to war if you and the conflict itself are attractive and popular. Hard power alone, like the US discovered in Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan, is not sufficient in the modern age for a swift and decisive conflict. Part 2. Cooperation. There are two main ways of viewing the potential outcomes of an interaction between states, a zero-sum game and a non-zero-sum game. In a zero-sum game, the understanding is that for one side to benefit, another side must inherently lose out. This is, for example, how some scholars think about military power. If I build more tanks, I have gained some power in relation to you. My gain is equivalent to your loss because you have lost as much security as I have gained. The net change is therefore always zero, hence zero-sum game. In a non-zero-sum game, however, which takes a variety of forms, the understanding is that there is potential for us both to benefit because we care about things other than competing with each other. If you produce wood, for example, and I'm really good at making tables, we can both benefit by trading with each other. In order to produce cooperation, neoliberals argue that we need to turn as many interactions between states as possible into non-zero-sum games, situations in which both sides can benefit. This means firstly fostering interdependence. For example, if our economies are dependent upon each other, then we are less likely to go to war. We therefore are incentivized to make policies which are in everyone's interest. As some scholars have argued, independent states are more likely to address their problems peacefully, typically through institutions. However, this isn't always the case. So let's take a look at one example of this not working to help us understand how cooperation can be built. Imagine you and an acquaintance have been caught committing a heinous and abhorrent crime that your government cannot abide, like infringing on Disney's copyright. And you've both sworn to each other that you will not confess, no matter what you are offered. You are each taken to an interview room and given two options. Stay silent or confess. Or in international relations terms, maintain your agreement or defect. If you both stay silent, you will likely receive a minor sentence. Two years in prison. However, if one of you stays silent but the other confesses, the confessor will go free. And the person who stayed silent will receive ten years in prison. This scenario here and this scenario here. And if you both confess, you will receive a distributed sentence of five years in prison each. This scenario here. It is up to you to decide which is best. This is a popular situation in game theory called the prisoner's dilemma. Now remember, we are assuming that these actors, both person A and person B, are rational and out for their own self-interest. And if we accept its premises, then it can tell us a few things about how these kinds of actors respond to the situation. The first things it tells us is that it's possible for all actors to be behaving in their own self-interest, but still end up in a situation where everyone is worse off. This contradicts some of the other international relations scholars or even economists who argue that if everyone just does what's best for them, that will result in the best situation for everyone. The second thing it tells us is that the higher the reward and the lower the cost of defection, the more likely it is to take place. The maintenance of trust is therefore tied up in the costs of doing so. Most game theorists, however, argue that in this situation, the rational thing to do is defect and betray your partner in crime. This is largely because the costs are likely to be spread between the two participants. I know that the other actor is rational and self-interested, like I am. Therefore, they are going to look out for themselves. They're going to defect. Therefore, I should defect too, so that instead of spending 10 years in prison, I'll only have 5. Or, if they're an idiot, I don't have to spend any time in prison at all. Neoliberals therefore use observations like this to identify hindrances to cooperation. For example, as we clearly saw, the fear of defection. If I cannot rely on you to keep to our agreement, then I have no incentive to either. I know you are self-interested and rational, just like I am, and so I know that it makes sense for you to defect if it benefits you. 
One major cause of this fear is the lack of information and communication. And this is one of the observations that really makes neoliberalism a product of the modern day. Historically, an inability to communicate effectively, like we saw in the prisoner's dilemma, meant actors could not coordinate their response to situations. Now, however, with the advancement of informational and communicative technologies, we have more chances for cooperation. States also fear what is called the free rider problem. And this is where some members of an agreement underpay or under contribute to the costs of that agreement. For example, President Trump often criticized criticised other members of NATO for failing to meet the agreed upon annual spending on defence choosing instead to benefit from American hegemony without giving enough back. The anticipation of future competition is also an issue. Even if we can agree that in a single situation we should cooperate, I might not want you to benefit at all. Why would I agree to help your economy if tomorrow you could turn around and turn that into a military advantage over me? Finally, the big barrier to cooperation which exacerbates all of these issues is a relative power difference. Basically, if a strong country and a weak country make a deal, what incentive does the strong country have to to keep to the agreement as soon as it's advantageous for them to do otherwise. These are just some of the problems which neoliberals seek to overcome through international institutions. So let's look at how it can be done. Part 3. Designing Institutions Firstly, there are generally two kinds of institutions, formal and informal, otherwise known as regimes. Formal institutions are those like the UN or NATO. They tend to have official buildings, formal memberships, and maybe even something like a constitution. Informal institutions or regimes can have some of these aspects, but largely exist in the realm of expectation rather than requirement. In the words of Stephen Krasner, who I should note is not a neoliberal, regimes are sets of implicit or explicit principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actors' expectations converge. The unspoken rules which govern international finance could be one example or the common understanding of national sovereignty. When designing formal institutions with the aim of increasing international cooperation, Jennifer Sterling Foker argues that there are three areas you need to focus on bargaining, defections, and autonomy. So this section will take each of these in turn, providing some advice on how to make them work. First, bargaining. How do states in your institution come to agreements about things? Starting with, do you have agreed upon rules for the logistics of bargaining? Are negotiations public or private? If details are public, you may incentivize states to tell the truth and protect their reputation, but you're unlikely to make progress quickly with that kind of scrutiny. If they're private, then you can get down to the dodgy details a lot faster. But if someone defects, then it becomes a he said, she said about what happened behind closed doors. Do you have an agreed location for negotiation to take place so that neither side has a home advantage? Do you include third parties in negotiations as a matter of course, for example, another state or an NGO that can oversee the process? Are bilateral negotiations allowed between just two states or does everyone in the institution have to be involved or at least have a right to be involved? Are there things you vote on? How do you decide on the things that you vote on? These logistical questions can be key to setting expectations and fostering success, so choose wisely. A major advantage which modern institutions have over those in the past are the level of informational and communicative technologies available. Mapping technologies can better than ever outline demilitarized zone, national borders, or fishing districts. Data collection and research can not only let you know that agreements are being maintained, but that they are having the desired outcome. And negotiations, updates, and clarifications can require something as simple as a Zoom call. General, you're on mute. The bargaining process is also impacted by the scope of your institution. Will you be like the EU with a huge range of responsibilities from monetary union to common defence, or will you be like the World Bank with a focused issue area? Being focused allows you to specialise and it means everyone involved doesn't have to sign up to bargain across a range of issues. You therefore may have an easier time getting states involved. However, if you are broad, then you can do what's called issue linkage, which is where you involve multiple issue areas in a bargain in order to come to a compromise. We may not be able to agree on a common strategic plan if we just just talk about that. But if you let me fish in some of your waters and I give you a reduced tariff on imports, then opportunities for cooperation expand. Secondly, your international institution has to know how to deal with defections. Now, there is one controversial idea in this area that it's important to mention, but isn't an essential part of this project, so you can take it or leave it. And that is called hegemonic stability theory. This theory posits that international institutions can only really be stable and prevent defection if there is a relative hegemon involved, say like the US, which has the power 
power to punish defection. Its proponents particularly point to the growing capitalist international economic order, which the US has been able to lead and sustain since the Second World War. This is, however, one of those theories that is popular in hegemonic countries and not so much in others. Defections can also be prevented by making states think more long term. What institutions do is make states view their relationship with other states as an iterative game, another concept which international relations pulls from game theory. An iterative game is a situation like the prisoner's dilemma we discussed before, but instead of only involving one instance, one decision, it plays out over multiple iterations. The logics involved therefore shift, because now I might not betray you because I have my reputation to think about. Similarly, membership in formal institutions makes states more likely to behave like they're in an iterative game, because their continued involvement involvement in the institution is dependent on them obeying the rules. Sanctions are of course one of the most popular ways to deal with defections when it does take place, and this is true of formal and informal institutions. The most common kinds of sanctions are of course diplomatic or economic. Diplomatic sanctions can involve expelling diplomats, suspending negotiations, or barring states from participating in your international institution until the defection is rectified. And economic sanctions often involve cutting off trade or some other form of economic activity to harm a state and its government. The key is making sure sanctions are effective and that they hold. The key question arises, what do you do when other members of your institution fail to employ the sanctions needed? The third area which Sterling Fokker emphasizes is the autonomy of your institution. In other words, is your institution able to set its own agenda and make its own decisions, or is it simply an extension of one state's power? You see, the problem with a relative power difference in your institution, or the problem with hegemonic stability theory, is that other states can tell if your institution is a farce. International institutions like the World Health Organization, or even the United Nations, operate on the premise that they are to some extent impartial adjudicators of world affairs. If this is not believed in, whether or not it's actually true will have a big impact on your international institution's ability to operate. You have to instill confidence in your members that a powerful state can't take the reins whenever it wants, or alternatively that power has to be so totalizing that it doesn't matter whether or not people can tell. Whether that sounds like cooperation is up to you. So that was neoliberalism, a theory that wrestles with some cynical assumptions about the world but still comes out believing that a better world is possible. In this video, we've covered the foundations of doing analysis and like a neoliberal, so let me know what you think of it in the comments down below. You can also find more videos here and on my channel. This overview is explicitly uncritical so that you can understand neoliberalism on its own terms. If you want me to go deeper into some of the problems and perspectives of this theory, then please let me know. And the more people who interact with this video, the more likely I am to upload more, so please do that. God bless you all, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>